I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Carlos Padron, a Latinx licensed psychoanalyst and an advanced candidate at the Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research, or IPTAR, in New York City. He originally studied philosophy in Venezuela, then earned a master's in philosophy with a concentration in psychoanalysis at the New School for Social Research, and finally a master's in philosophy in Latin American literature at New York University. He has written and presented on the intersections between philosophy, literature, and psychoanalysis, and was a teaching fellow at NYU and a faculty member at John Jay College, part of the CUNY system, as well as the Contemporary Freudian Society and the China American Psychoanalytic Alliance. Carlos is currently a faculty member at IPTAR, where he co-teaches a class on clinical aspects of diversity. He is a contributor to the book and documentary Psychoanalysis in El Barrio, which is currently available for free on PepWeb. A link to that is included in the text accompanying this episode. Currently, he is working on an article for a special issue of psychoanalytic psychology tentatively titled Notes from a Pandemic, Reflections from 19 Clinicians on the Year of COVID-19. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious psychoanalytic perspectives, politics, and poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated for more information you can also visit my website dr vanessa sinclair.net or the podcast main website rendering unconscious.org Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Well, well I, what I was just doing before we started talking, I was I'm writing an essay for uh, about you know the different experience of different clinicians during the COVID pandemic. And I had been writing some notes since the beginning, just for myself with no particular uh, ulterior motive, and I found uh, I was checking now the the first dream I had uh, after the sheltering in place started in New York City, where I live, uh, and it was about uh, I had forgotten about it. It was about my father's father dying, and then my father crying and being unconsolable. Uh, my father's father he died years ago, and I, I wasn't very close to him in any case. But it, it made me, it, it, I was, I was, that was the first dream after I was sheltering in place. And I started to think about it and check my notes. And there was this sense that I think it was ultimately me being my, you know, fear of me losing my own father and what that represents. Uh, you know, that's the surface thing. He's in his 70s, but also kind of like this sense of feeling helpless or unprotected. And, and then the question, you know, if, I, if I'm my father, in the dream, then who's going to take care of me, right? Uh, so I and I, I remember those feelings of helplessness and extreme vulnerability, especially uh, since um, I'm an immigrant. I'm from Latin America. I've been here 15 years, so I've I've had the experience of, of an immigrant 
from another country um, and a brown person from another country and it brought it brought those memories uh uh, and my own past here, uh, and I connected it to those of, you know, the most of the patients that I see who are people of color, and uh, that's about, you know, 90, 90, 90% of my practice are people of color, and uh, some of them uh, now and in the past have been impoverished or, or working class, um, and how they have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Uh, so I could, you know, I thought of them and how I could only imagine, because in comparison to them, obviously I've been quite privileged, uh, you know, uh, what they were going through. Um, so that was one thing that I've been thinking about this morning. I don't know if it's a good <laughs> way to start the, the day or not. Um, and, um, and about, you know, how the unprotection is not only if we're thinking about it psychoanalytically, not only, of course, you know, the lack of, of uh, resources, medical resources, availability, uh, you know, the housing, uh, it's not economic and, and social and political, but also what I was thinking too is that there's also kind of like a, a lack of, of uh, if you want to think it in, let's say in Winnicottian terms, there's like a lack of a, social holding environment for people of color, uh, especially impoverished and, and working class, where there is a lack of, of kind of like a discourse that, uh, you know, uh, or a social discourse that, that makes them feel held or that they're part of, of, of something, a part of a broader society, of a broader society. And, and this holding is, is not only, is, is goes deeper, it's not in the direction of, you know, uh, you know object relations. Uh, uh, it's more on, a, it's these, this lack of discursive holding is, is at the level of whether or not they belong to, who, to those who are people or to those who are citizens, right? So it's, it's a more, it's a, it's, there's a, it's a difference. It, it runs deep in the psyche, but it, it touches on 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 is, uh, deeper issues of identity and existence, and um, uh, so that that's one thing. And especially coming from Venezuela, I come from Venezuela, where there well, currently there is no doubt a uh, what I would without a doubt call a dictatorial regime. Um, and uh, but originally, where I come from. Uh, where when I came here 15 years ago, you know, Venezuela has always been like a rather, like any social world, a, th a third country, uh, uh, you know, that ha had a lot, well, so-called third country, third world country, has had many economic difficulties, so a lot of poverty, and a lot of people, they, um, in uh, the elections of 91, when Chavez won, uh, he had a discourse that, again, going back to this idea of being held, where people, poor people felt recognized and kind of like identified with it. And that's another thought that coming from there, I have here in the United States where there's this rise of uh, some form of populism, if we want to call it, but more right-wing populism, where many people, especially impoverished and working class, white people are finding themselves identified with, uh, and which is understandable, but it has, you know, the danger of, of well, we know, we know, uh, we, I wouldn't have to talk about it, the dangers of Trump, but of any populist, uh, narcissistic uh, uh, leader. Uh, so I think that's also a way of talking about how I always find myself in between, you know, like one foot still in, in uh, Venezuela, one foot in the United States in many ways. And that's the experience of any immigrants and immigrants that I, that I work with, where you're sort of living in this in-between space uh, that can be very productive. It can be, as we continue with Winnicott, it can be a trans transitional or potential space where there's the possibility of creativity, invention, uh, play, even invention and play with your own sense of identity and who you are. That can be very liberating at times, but other times is, uh, you know, it can feel like living in limbo, um, which, you know, I always joke with that, the, Ratzinger, the previous pope, he eliminated limbo, 
uh, as as a place to be. So so the people who were already uh, the souls were in limbo now they're literally in the limbo. Just <laughs> I don't know where they went to. Um, so it's that kind of that sort of limbo that can be also anxiety producing and and for us produce a lot of distress, confusion, uh, a lot of conflict uh, where, you know, many immigrants live uh, first generation, second generation, even third generation. You know, uh, I can give the example of uh, Chicano people here in the United States, right? They, they, they are dismissed as being, well, you know, it's, this is a case of the Chicano being appropriated by the community uh, as, as a way of kind of like incorporating that name that was used to attack them, right? Uh, or like using it uh, to identify themselves with. Uh, but it was used as like, you know, you don't belong here, you're from Mexico. But if they go back to Mexico, they're called pochos there, meaning that they're gringos, they're, they're not really Mexicans anymore. So again, it, it's a, a place of a uh, struggle with identities. And, and so I also identify with that. Um, I've always said that I could uh, kind of like tell the, the the story of my being here in the United States through the story of my dreams. And maybe that's why I started with a dream because I keep register of some of them and, and they're very, they, they match. I found how much they match those of the people that I see, uh, you know, many dreams how, and how they shifted over the years and how they tell so much of where my mind is, uh, is a uh, place, right? Uh, uh, spatially uh, speaking, uh, where do I feel more from here, more from there? Um, you know, many dreams where, you know, I, I'm in, let's say, Venezuela, and I have had patients have dreams like that from whatever country, whichever country they come from. Uh, they, they're there, and then all of a sudden they're kind of like they're with their people, uh, sharing and very familiar places, and all of a sudden they're there, they, there's this moment of confusion where they say, oh, I don't, but I'm not from here anymore. Um, I, I don't live here. This is not where I'm at. And then not being able to find your way back to the United States. Um, I've had dreams like that or the opposite, right? That I'm in the United States and then I'm all of a sudden, what am I doing here? This is like a vacation. Uh, I want to go back. So this, you know, this, again, this, this, mo this moment of confusion that has shifted over the years. Um, um, that would be a fascinating book, I would say, of a book of immigrants and their dreams. Um, and because I found, and how they start, you know, in the transference, counter transference matrix, I think there's, we start dreaming of things that are similar because, you know, we've been through similar experiences. Um, so that's another thing. Uh, I guess that would tie into uh, you know, the, the work that I've done with working with uh, disadvantaged people of color, particularly Latinx people, um, as can be shown in the psychoanalysis in El Barrio documentary that came out in 2016, um, where many uh, uh, psychoanalysts with uh, Latino or Latinx or Latin American background speak about their experience working with the, the population uh, or the, you know, the, 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 the Hispanic community, the Latinx community, and kind of like challenging these ideas that it's not, only, uh, it's not only reduced to Latinx people, but it's this idea that it's broadly speaking that poor people can't, you know, can't reflect, can't think, they, or they're not in some way psychologically sophisticated so they can't really do an analysis. Um, and uh, so that what they, you know, the kind of treatment that they have to, that is the treatment of choice for pe poor people is more symptom focused, manualistic, um, you know, short-term kind of therapy. Um, what I say is that this is a, a general bias that there is with poor people, but that gets racialized when it comes to black or brown people, right? Then there, there's this thought that it's almost that there's inherently uh, psychological lack in black and brown people because there's this connection between poverty and, and the prejudices that people have towards poverty. It gets uh, intertwined with prejudices with, against black and brown people. So um, 
so a bit challenging that and how we've worked um, in privately clinical centers, um, uh, to speak about myself, but also in, in agencies, mental health clinics, where, you know, I, I work uh, psychodynamically speaking once, twice a week, therapy, whatever, you know, Medicaid would allow, that was the only limitation. Uh, uh, would I work psychodynamically or psycho psychoanalytically with any kind, with no kind of alteration or change or, or you know, like adaptation in, in any way? Uh, you know, I had, I worked at the Puerto Rican Family Institute in, in, uh, in the clinic in Brooklyn, in Bushwick, where there's a, a hot, very, you know, there's a Puerto Rican community that, uh, uh, well, that's been being, being slowly displaced, by the way, from there. Uh, and I saw them and I, you know, I did, I had my little office and I, I bought like the, the garden seat. I got like a little garden seat that was like, a little bit like couch like where I would see people kind of like on the couch um, and uh, well not I don't know why I'm quoting it but it, it was on the couch but it wasn't like a real couch it was like more like a lying chair uh, and I, I changed them well that, that's not a it's not a problem I mean that's the point right I think that it's not we we focus too much on the on the um, what could they could be called like just things that we're used to, right? But to working with, but that, you know, they're so aleatory. Uh, they're not rules really, but people make them as, make them rules. I think generally analysts in order for them to feel safer and feel more like they're working as an analyst that they're doing analytic work. Um, so going, but I did that work. I would, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm sorry if I get too specific, but you know, they're, you know, there was this terrible white, you know, white light, uh, you know, and I changed it so people felt more, more intimate and closer and, they could, you know, focus and pr probably dream more there with me. And, and you know, um, I did work there. Um, and you would be very surprised at how appreciative at the beginning the people were to simply have a therapist there who would just shut up and listen. Right at the beginning, they were actually telling me, like, "Are you going to ask? Are you going to tell me something, or tell me what to do, or give me homework, or give me a breathing exercise?" Uh, and I was like, "But uh, they were anxious about my silence." Um, and I, but they were also very appreciative. They told me, "Look, I've never been heard this way in the clinic and in my life, generally speaking." Right. Uh, so they got used to, you know, that way of working and they became curious about themselves, about their dreams, about um, uh, their symptoms um, uh, in the way they hadn't been curious before. Um, you know, uh, it, but it gets an analyst to just, you know, one thing is that we learn uh, or that we have to learn is that you have to speak the patient's language, right? Language, by that language, I don't mean the literal, you know, the national language, but their idiom, like the way they think, the way they express themselves. So it's the same thing. So I think it's been there's this bias that since uh, certain populations don't think uh, in this intellectually, let's say, sophisticated way, then they're not thinking. But what it means to think and reflect means very different things for, diff for the very different people. And, and it doesn't it doesn't mean, you know, rational understanding or conceptual understanding. You know, people think through stories, through poetry, through dance, through many expressions. And a lot of analysts have been biased towards one way of thinking. I and mean, whatever falls out of that means that, uh, you know, the person is not analyzable or, or analysis is not drug treatment of choice. And on the other hand, on the side of the mental health system here in the, in the United States, it's uh, again the same bias that they're so pressured by you know by poverty and which is true they are very pressured by you know he, being poor is a full time job I always say it right you 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 know you have to be constantly looking for aid and services uh, there isn't a single poor patient that I've seen that doesn't have also you know physical illnesses they all everything comes together. Uh, so, you know, going to multiple doctors and lines and being told it's a, it's a tiring and full-time job that 
I think constantly we traumatize the, the, the patient and reminds them, going back to what I was saying at the beginning, that they don't belong, that they're being kind of like thrown the scraps of whatever's left. Um, and um, so, uh, interestingly, I had a, a, I don't, I went blank there. Uh, <laughs> I forgot what I was talking about. Um, maybe, I, I don't know what it is it about it. I think it could be that it reminds me of working uh, at the clinic, which was a very, very, uh, was a learning experience, but it was also very difficult and very painful for me um, to see that amount of trauma and and feeling my own impotence, right? And in, in in you know, I'm also very socially minded and politically minded. So when I was there, I was like, you know, sometimes like, what am I doing? This, this doesn't seem enough. This just seems like a little bandage that I'm putting on the person. Uh, this goes, this is such a broader problem that what can psychoanalysis do in the front, front of this, you know, of this huge uh, socioeconomic problem. So I guess that it was, it was, it was difficult, enlightening for me, difficult for me. Um, um, and um, I, I still have memories. And that was what the, the documentary was about. It challenges these things, these assumptions, this way of working, this, managed care so to speak i think it's more it's it's uh it functions in the way of i think what what foucault would call like an apparatus the mental health clinic the mental health system here right it's like a set of ideologies about what's mental health what's subjectivity what's normal and then a set of specific practices that are legal but also clinical and that it's you know and then where poor people brown and black poor people they they're basically managed and and in a way to for them not to be a problem in some way i was always angry about the freaking uh uh um breathing exercises that's there was two forms of therapy that well therapy that i saw there that i was always always very angry with one um, was the, what I call just like chit chatty therapy. It's like you just you know sit with the therapy and the therapist and and just talk like you're talking to a friend. Of course, talking is always going to be therapeutic and helpful. I mean, um, in in any way, even if you don't know what you're doing, talking to somebody helps. But you know there was this this ongoing just kind of like talking with a friend that didn't really produce any significant change in the person, or the you know the more teaching patients coping techniques which I always found odd you know it's kind of like when working with poor people it's kind of like teaching them how to cope with their misery um, and their breathing exercises I, I, I was thinking the other day so after COVID and and the the whole racial upset here in the United States interestingly kind of like condensed in the phrase I can't breathe um, how are you going to tell poor patients to do breathing exercises, right? That would be like the ultimate irony and the ultimate way of, of trying to control them. Um, because I think that's, I, I don't think this is a conscious thing. I, I really much uh, actually uh, appreciate social workers, mental health workers who work in clinics, very much so. They're in the forefront of the, you know, the social war, I think doing a lot of important work but with no tools no help uh badly paid etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know so they're, so they're just captured by the system where you know you think you're trying to do the, your best but in a way you what you're doing is just perpetuating the, the mystery of the patient so i think that's where psychoanalysis if you're humble and then you don't you try to you know, uh, exercise your savior fantasies that might come up when working with uh, with poor populations, especially if you're socially minded, um, conscious or less conscious. Uh, you know, like when I was like anxious, I'm not doing enough, right? So I might be inclined to maybe do too much, right? And I, as we all know, you know, when you try to perhaps do too much or try to save somebody, you don't really help them. It gets in the way of the treatment. So you have to deal with that you're on your own 
Uh, but it's the only form of treatment that I think has a uh, utter respect for the other person's subjectivity. That's the one thing in its whole dimension, it's unconscious dimension. Uh, so it's like a depth, uh, in that sense, it's a depth psychology or a depth uh, uh, philosophy of, of how the mind and subjectivity works. Uh, and number two, it, it, ideally it has a understanding of how the mind or subjectivity is intimately intertwined with, with society, culture. Um, I think that's less, has been less of a case here in the United States than in, in uh, psychoanalytic understanding of uh, the psychoanal psychoanal uh, American psychoanalytic version, uh, as opposed to in Europe or Latin America, where there's, you know, the society and mind and are not uh, separate in the analytic understanding. So that's a, a second thing. And the third thing I would say is that it has this, uh, um, you know, in a way it has this ultimate, not, I don't think an analysis has like a final goal, but at least it's, it has this idea, this, uh, I think that's the idea of freedom is present in psychoanalysis. And we don't talk about it enough these days. You don't find it in papers uh, about talking about a, you know, a psychology or a, or a, a freedom in somehow. Um, so, but I, I have found that you know, it promotes some sorts of freedom, you know. Uh, I speak about it in a documentary and other people talk about it there, about how, for example, internalized forms of oppression, identifying with the oppressor and the complex dynamics that, that, that develop around that. Uh, you know, once people become aware of that, you know, which is a simple, if you think about it as a simple thing or it's a simple intervention, uh, you know, you would ask, it's telling the person, well, why would you treat yourself the same way that you were mistreated, uh, right? Um, you know, why would you be a racist towards yourself when, you know, you suffered from racism all your life? That's, that's the first questioning, right? And there's a logic behind that, that, that I think psychoanalysis has uh, understood. Um, so when people and, and sustaining these forms of internal oppression takes a lot of psychic energy uh, to sustain them. And I, in my mind, when these things, these energies that are bound and that uh, bind people to now within the scope of their own mind, they're freed up, you know, people, Again, it's not, I mean, and that's something that I, 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 I think about in, in, uh, in the paper I wrote for a book that was called Psychoanalysis in El Barrio, which is a compilation of different, yeah, that one there, <laughs> uh, that, uh, so there, that was an interesting, that came after the documentary, and I, I write there about, uh, you know, about the political potentiality of the psychoanalytic process. So it's not that I come as a, you know, I become the political activist of the analysis or I, I try to do political work on them and convince them to do this or that. But I think that the, the freeing up a person's subjectivity is a political action, I think, by definition. Uh, so then that people might be able to be a little freer to choose this or that or to, you know, uh, uh, and to you know lead more freely the kind of life that they they want to lead within the, all the the constraints and determinations in which their lives are embedded in, because you know there is no freedom without without li limit limitations. It's, one thing goes with the other, but at least there's a more con uh, they become more conscious of what's limiting you and what's in the way. And I think people might become more critical of their of their life and what and what you know, oppresses them, suppresses them, erases them, however you want to call it. So, and I'm not conscious, I'm not, I mean, that's not my goal, right? Uh, my goal is to understand that internalized, you know, logic of, of oppression and to help the person understand how it's making their lives. It, it produces symptoms, it produces uh, depression, it produces anxiety, but then the result is that is, 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 can be potentially what I just mentioned before. Um, 
So that's the other thing. And the third, well, I, I mentioned three things of why psychoanalysis was, uh, I think, a good treatment of choice. And the fourth one that I'm, uh, comes to mind now is that the, the relationship itself uh, in the form of a transference, counter-transference matrix, if you are, or let's call it the relation, the, the relation between you and the patient is examined. And I think that's something that is kept in mind uh, and it's something to talk about. Uh, that's unique, I think, in when it comes to form, uh, other forms of therapy. And the reason why I think that examining the relationship is important, I think, in therapy in general, but particularly with people who have been subjects of oppression or suppression, invisibilized, is how these things come up in the relationship between you and the patient. And, you know, the same forms of oppression, you might become, you know, the oppressor for the patient. And not only in the sense of, in the transference, that they experience you as the oppressor, that might be the case, but you might actually get caught up in the logic of where you are unconsciously and in subtle ways suppressing the patient. Going back to the savior complex, right? Mm -hmm. You become too active and you want to try to tell the patient, you know, maybe give them an advice here and there, tell them what to do here and there. And you feel that it's, it's, it's uh, innocuous, right? It's, like, it doesn't know, it's, it's innocuous, right? It doesn't make a difference. But it's, at some level, it's like you're repeating the same experience they've had their whole lives of being told what to do, being infantilized, and thus assuming that they can't think or act by themselves. So again, this gets repeated, right, these things, because the, the transference, counter-transference matrix is not only about uh, early object relations that are somehow get reproduced in the therapeutic relationship, the, at least as I see it, uh, the transference counter transference matrix is also, what happens there is also a historical repetition, right? Because it's not a repetition, let's say of childhood, it's a repetition of history. Mm -hmm. It's not a rep only a repetition of personal history, it's a repetition of the history, uh, broader, uh, of, uh, of collective history. Um, uh, some analysts might not necessarily think that, but uh, I, don't, I don't know how they can think that way because uh, that way of thinking supposes that the analytic diet and the treatment occurs kind of like in a social and historical vacuum, right? It's like you're in your, and I, and I, and I think that's the, the, the fantasy that the privacy of the office gives you, right? Like we're somehow in kind of like put in, it's like a parenthesis right here, what's happening. Um, even somehow Lowell, who was understanding of, of the political, of, of, of the social aspect of, of, of uh, the analytic treatment, when he talks about the interpersonal, uh, he still talks about how, and I think it comes actually from Freud, if, uh, as far as I recall, this idea that the, the analytic space is this, is this kind of like place of exception, right? Where it's, it's kind of like taken outside because people, you know, the analyst is, that might be pushed to act this or that way by the patient, but we don't act this or that way, right? We, uh, we, can, we, we interpret instead of, instead of acting. But that's a very uh, highly idealized version of, of the analytic situation. Um, it reminds me of a, of a, of a poem by uh, Borges, uh, you know, the, the Argentinian writer. It's called The Yellow Rose. And there's a moment in, well, it's, it's a poem, but he says the, uh, the poet, he looks at the books in his library and he says that he, he came to the realization, like the sudden realization, that the books are not only a mirror of the world, but also a thing added to the world, he says. And I think I've all, it reminds me of analysis, right? We, analysis is not a mirror of the world only, but it's also a thing of the world. So in that sense, it doesn't happen in a political or historical vacuum. So uh, the transference, counter-transference dynamic, or just talk about the relationship is meant to uh, repeat historical historical uh, situations, especially uh, in you know when there's uh, differences of races 
between between page between pay, uh, patient and analyst or an analyst and analyzer, however you want to call it. Uh, these or there's differences in gender. Uh, when there's difference, the history of conflicts between these differences or these two poles or these polarities are, I believe, are meant to come up, and not only in a personal way, but it's in a historical way. And we have to be mindful of that. So that's the fourth reason why I think psychoanalysis is is, is uh, very relevant in working, well, generally with people, of course, uh, but especially with, with people that have been somehow excluded from the, the, the space of analysis. Um, so yeah, that's, again, I, that ties again to the, to the documentary. We talk about that. These things, um, we talk about what, how I started the interview with you about the life and the life of the immigrant, uh, bilingualism, which is a fascinating topic, which again is living in between two languages and how language is used in the, in the therapeutic uh, situation or setting uh, to defensively, or it can be used uh, to, let's say, speak Spanish and English. I, I had to do my, my analysis in English, which is not, I mean, I'm pretty bilingual, but still I feel more comfortable speaking in Spanish and more especially in an analysis, right? So mm -hmm. there wasn't anybody that I could find. Well, that, that would open a whole other can of worms, which is how you know, white institutes, I'm not talking about the white institute, I'm talking about how white institutes are uh, in the United States, which was, you know, did not allow me to find a uh, training analyst who spoke Spanish. Um, or, you know, I didn't have a choice. I think there was one, but I, I you know, it wasn't my choice. Uh, so I had to do it in English, and that was quite an experience, right? Of, of uh, you know, sometimes several things come to mind, right? It's like, and you probably had that experience with people, or perhaps, well, you speak two languages, you live in another country, so uh, like we we become different people when we speak different languages, mm -hmm. or different aspects of ourselves come more to the fore or to the forefront. Uh, it's kind of like language is able to kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know, it's like kind of like trap or, or, or some aspects of us stick better with some languages than with the other, right? And so I, um, I, that was an experience for me, how I, these different uh, versions of myself in two languages uh, and how I see them in patients um, when they switch languages, for example. That's, uh, it's quite an uncanny experience, by the way. Uh, it reminds me of a, a patient. I had a, a black woman in her 70s who um, was from the, is from the Caribbean. I don't see her anymore for years, but she's from the Caribbean. And she came to the U.S. and she had to learn how to speak. She told me the white way, you know, white talk. Um, so she spoke that way. But when, when, when she started to see, when she saw me, she had already retired and she told me that she after she retired she said i can't speak the white way anymore i want to speak the caribbean way that's how she spoke to me when we when when treatment and when she told me that when that came up in the treatment she told me if she wanted me to see how her white talk was and i said yeah and it was like and she spoke a different way and i, I had been seeing her like for a year and it was like I was seeing another person in front of my eyes. It was very uncanny. Um, and um, so, you know, that speaks about the, the, I think in my mind, how forced it had been for her, right? The pressure of speaking in another, in a way that you can't, that you don't want to speak, but that you're forced to, in order to find a job, in order to, was in her case, to find a job, to feel more socially accepted, et cetera. And, and I think that uncanniness was that she was like two different people in one. So there was like no integration between the two uh, at all, right? It was, uh, so, um, so I've seen that quite a bit uh, um, and, um, and how people sometimes they use the second language to, to, to be more defensive I've definitely done it. 
uh, but also the second language insofar as it's perhaps a little more detached from emotional, strong emotions or strong affects, then it allows you to slowly get to them, you know, piece by piece. Uh, so I've, you know, that's a fascinating experience. Uh, what well, has been with me, and and it also has made me more attentive to when people switch languages, where, uh, use a, a language, they switch a languages within a session, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you start seeing patterns emerging, and you'll just mention that you know you change. Well, after a while, probably you know you were, you were speaking in Spanish, and then you switch to English to say that word, and then you'll discover that there's a whole history behind the word, perhaps why they use that word in English. There's a whole other, you know, it opens up a whole web of connections that were not a, not available for, for analysis at the moment. Or they're using that word because if they said it in Spanish, it would be too anxiety producing, uh, you know, so it's all sorts of things. So that's something that it becomes you as an analyst sensitive to to uh, to language, well, I mean, I think we're all we all should be very sensitive to language, to different, you know, how people change the tone, use a certain word that they normally don't use, they cut a word, they all. I mean, we're all aware of this, but when there's bilingualism, it adds another layer to understand and to analyze. And I, and I mentioned that because many immigrants are that I treat are bilingual. Uh, or they speak Spanglish, right? A mixture of the two languages, which is a language unto itself, um, uh, which is also very interesting. So uh, actually people will speak three languages, English, Spanish, and Spanglish. So you have to keep your ear to like the three, these three things occurring simultaneously, sometimes in the scope of one session. Um, so, uh, and then out of the, the, that documentary came the idea which was actually, uh, it, it was edited by Christopher Christian and Patricia Gerovici, uh, who are both analysts. Uh, uh, you know, Patricia's originally from Argentina and Chris from Puerto Rico. So they wanted to put together uh, a book on, on well, continue, make a, like a printed version of the documentary, except you know, I, uh, we talked and, and it was thought that maybe you know, expanding it not only to uh, analysts, but also scholars who work with, uh, you know, scholars that work on, let's say, let's connect uh, on literature or critical theory. And that's how the volume came out, uh, which I think is, it's, it's quite unique, I, I would say. As the documentary is very unique, I haven't seen uh, books, a book or a documentary on that specific topic here in the U.S., so I think it's one of a kind. Um, and actually this started years ago when, um, um, when uh, I started at IPTAR, which is the Psychoanalytic Institute in New York City, uh, a study group in, on Latin American psychoanalysis. Um, and, um, and then Chris, Christian came to the group, we started talking, and then we did a a first conference on Latin American psychoanalysis at the New School. Um, I don't think Latin American psychoanalysis is not very known here in the U.S. I think sadly because some very interesting things are being done there. Uh, places like Argentina, Uruguay, Mexico, Brazil, very important things are being done there. Uh, they don't know about that. Well, a lot, many times because it's, you know, there's no translation in English. Um, and well, that's a problem unto itself, and it's also symptomatic that you, you know, most of the things that people read are only in English, um, and everything else is kind of like left aside. It's kind of kind of like it doesn't exist. Kind of like the rest of what the IPA used to call the the rest of the world. Um, uh, and uh, so we did that that, and then there was a second conference at the New School that was called the first time we used the. the Title Psychoanalysis in El Barrio, which was about the same topic. And there were uh, with Patricia Ernesto Mujica, who's an analyst from the White Institute, and myself presenting cases uh, with this, with, with uh, Latinx uh, patients. Uh, there were clinical presentations, basically, and uh, how we work psychoanalytically with them. And then the, the, the documentary came out through a PEP web grant. 
um, and and now, so the people are here watching uh, this for this month. It's for you know, Pep Web is a my subscription website, but now it's free uh, for a month. So I invite you to see it on. Uh, I think you will you, you will put it on uh, for people to have access to. Uh, so you know, we've we've uh, shown the documentary in different venues, different places, and done Q and A's, and it's 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 both fascinating and sad that how, how much of what we're talking about seems so very alien to many psychoanalysts here in the U.S. Uh, reminds me of, uh, I can give you an example of once we presented it at one well-known analytic institute here in, in New York, uh, the, the, the documentary, and then there was a Q&A, and then there was this analyst who had been working for, for a long while, um, and then he said, you know, he works in, uh, he has his office in Harlem, in West Harlem. Well, if people who don't know, it's, it's, it's mostly a, a black uh, neighborhood, which has becoming more and more gentrified over the years. And he had his office there, and he had, he'd been seen for a while, a black patient who came to see him. And the first thing that the black patient said was that how much he hated white people gentrifying his neighborhood. And this analyst has told us that he'd never discussed that with the patient, like why he had chosen to see a white analyst in Harlem, right? After in the first session complaining that white people are gentrifying their neighborhood. They never had had a talk about race. Uh, and I found that fascinating. So telling of how disconnected American psychoanalysis has become from social and cultural issues, including race, which is, well, just people just have to see what's going on in the US today, what has been uncovered by COVID, uh, what has, you know, the protests, the marches that are going on. Uh, so why wouldn't race be part of uh, a psychoanalytic treatment, especially in that case that I'm, that I'm saying? It also speaks of how scared people are to, uh, to talk about race, how analysts are scared of talking about race. You know, we're supposedly trained to be able to talk about anything, right? We can talk about what, what people feel more uncomfortable with, what, sex, money, uh, those are, you know, big ones. Why not race, right? So we're, nobody's trained for that. And actually people in analytic institutes believe that race is kind of like a, a superficial layer uh, in the constitution of the mind, right? Sex, sexuality runs deep into the constitution of the mind. There's a psychosexual developmental history that psychoanalysis has had since Freud, right? But my question has always been the why isn't, why doesn't race also touch deeply the constitution of the mind when the interactions, for example, between mother and, 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 and the baby are from the get-go traversed by racial relations. Um, so I've always been puzzled by that, and it's always seemed to me a bit of a resistance on the analytic establishment here to incorporate race, which is because it's a sensitive topic. And also the, this, you know, uh, uh, for now, for me, very sad aspiration that that a, a psycho, American psychoanalysis has had to become, a, you know, a, a medical institution. So, uh, you know, what, what's happened here in the U.S. Uh, to be to become some sort of a science in the in the sense in which the natural sciences are, and which I believe psychoanalysis is not. And not is not only that it can't not be that it, it isn't. It's of a it's a different order of discourse and and practice. So in that sense, it's with these natural sciences aspirations, issues of culture make no sense or of history. There's like, well, you know, that, well, you know, a patient might use uh, usual uh, uh, racial symbols to, or racial imagery to express what are ultimately mom and dad dynamics and the whole Oedipal thing. And then it's reduced to the Oedipal, which is finally the one thing that's universal. I think that's all, you know, frankly, resistant, if not simply BS, because I'm just already tired of explaining it. I don't, I don't, I don't see uh, uh, 
I, I don't want to argue with that anymore. I think it's a waste of time, frankly. Yeah, and even the way psychoanalysis started with hysteria, the like looking at hysteria, the medical doctors were all looking at hysteria like as if this is just something biologically wrong with these women and not taking into fact the social context of like all these male, white male doctors, like looking at all these women, you know, it's like, <laughs> there's a whole social context here of why these particular people are the ones acting out. Exactly, right? <laughs> and, and the social, and how the doctors themselves are involved in the same problem that they're trying to understand, right? And that they, in order to exclude themselves from the problem, they see it as, no, this, is, this has to be something physiological in the hysterical woman, right? Which is what happened uh, well up until Freud, you know, uh, we have to give him that, let, you know, let the hysteric speak. Uh, uh, but again, I, I guess, so you become in, you're part of, uh, that's fascinating, right? That, that the, the medical doctors trying to understand the hysteric, you know, you imagine uh, what, a Charcot in, in his, you know, this, these auditoriums where they would bring a woman and then being exposed to these multiple male gazes, et cetera. It's like, a, it's an enactment of, you know, the social dynamics that are making the, the woman produce these symptoms, right? Um, and with the total disavowal of, of your own involvement in it. And that ties in with what I was talking about before, that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that psychoanalysis is not, or nothing is, is just a mirror of the world, it's a part of the world, right? So that in the treatment, and that's what I think ideally happens, you have to understand your own involvement in, in the same process, right? So that you and the person might be enacting or reenacting. You might reenacting with a woman this whole, this whole, uh, you know, hysteric, uh, the hyster the, like the theater of hysteria from the 19th century, unbeknownst to yourself, right? So, and that's a historical thing. Uh, so, so that's, a, yeah, that's a great example. So you just put it in the, in the, in the, in the form of some, something biological or physiological, it was the case. Uh, and then, and then, um, you know, there's, it's also a form of control, right? Of controlling, of controlling the, 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 let's say the subject, which becomes then an object of study. Um, I think then Freud lets the hysteric speak, but well, if we read the Dora case, he also has uh, some this now this urge to interpret the Dora without remainder. He wants to interpret everything, so he still has that that I think very uh, we might call it patriarchal urge of control, and we see there constantly Dora protesting and then making making the treatment incomplete and the text about the treatment incomplete because this is a fragment of the treatment of hysteria. He couldn't finish it. What he doesn't see, again, he discovers, and then he, he discovers the transference there. He says it's some, an element of the transference that was getting in the way of the treatment. But what he doesn't see, again, is the, his own countertransference, in, right? Again, so it's like a, a little bit of the repetition of the same theory of his hysteric, mm -hmm. but now within psychoanalysis and within the space of interpretation. Right, uh, I find that fascinating how that thing got translated. I think the translation is better than before uh, because, well, it's less dehumanizing to begin with. What what, what was done to to women and 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 mental uh, people with mental pathologies before you know since like talk therapy began, it's better. But it's still some form of reproduction of 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 these patriarchal and misogynistic. Uh, you know, prejudices without noticing your implication in it. Um, and I think that's important, again, in working with, and you're talking about women, with groups of people who have been marginalized, attacked, oppressed, et cetera. It's particularly uh, uh, important to, to be aware of these things. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, and I think I also have a, I mean, uh, um, 
when I told you that I was like tired of arguing about these things with some people, because I think it's sometimes a waste of time. It's just better to do it, you know, do your own work, work with the people that you want to help, do things out, out, you know, out of school, right? I, 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 if the, um, I think it's my, uh, my, I might tell you a little bit where I'm situated and where I come from, which is I don't even come from the mental health field. I, I, I was, I, before I was, uh, I, I came from Venezuela and I used to be an academic in philosophy. Um, and then here in the United States, I studied philosophy too and, 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 uh, and, and Latin American literature. Um, but I was always interested in in uh, in um, uh, in psychoanalysis and the intersections between psychoanalysis, philosophy, and and literature, more like the continuities and discontinuities between them. Uh, I'm still am uh, very interested in that. Uh, but I felt that on, it wasn't until I I had been in my own analysis before in Venezuela. Uh, and then here, as an immigrant, I, I also started therapy, not a, you know, like once a week, twice a week, uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And, and then I, I felt that unless I, there were two things. One, that unless I trained, I, I wasn't really, I wasn't, I didn't really know what I was talking about. It became, started to become like too abstract. Uh, and I have this tendency towards abstraction which I, I've, I've tried to work over the years because uh, <laughs> it becomes very natural to me. Uh, and it was become, and, and the reason working, um, I worked on it is because it seemed like, started to seem like too disconnected from, well, from myself, from people, from like very ungrounded in many important ways. So that's my personal thing. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing was that, I felt that I, which is related to the first, that I really wanted to to work with people. Uh, I work with people, right? Of course, I, you, you teach. If you're academic, you teach. But I mean, like working with people in the more uh, direct, perhaps closer, more emotionally charged way. Um, um, and um, I... So I did a uh, uh, iptar. I at, I met at the new school. My advisor was Alan Bass, who was who is an analyst, also a philosopher, uh, translator of Derrida, uh, and he told me up that iptar had a two-year respecialization program, which is two year for people who don't come from the mental health field. So I said, well, let me do two years, and and you know feel get a feel for it. Uh, you know, you could see like one or two patients. And I started to see that I, I really liked it. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing, but I liked it, right? I, um, and, and then I applied for a, analytic training and they accepted me. Um, so I was very happy, but by the time that I applied, I was sure that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, so it took me a while also together with that adapting to you know, the, uh, to living in another country, kind of like adapting to kind of like re, refashioning my, my identity as a psychoanalyst. That took a while. Uh, I felt like, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, or thinking myself more primarily as that and, and less as, a, less as an academic. Um, and I, I find it interesting. I always tell people there's two things I, I, there's things I like, many things that I like about the work. One is that I rarely get bored. Uh, there's always this sense of surprise that comes with each new session and, and that ability to let yourself be surprised for something new to happen. So I rarely get bored. Um, and when I get bored, I think it's, it always tells me something about the relationship and about the other person, what might be going on. Um, and the, and another thing is that, um, you know, when you're, when you're uh, an academic and you do, you know, in literature or in philosophy, you know, you interpret, you interpret books, texts, mostly. But what's fascinating with analysis, you interpret people, but as opposed to books, this people answer back, right? 
And I think that's a big difference. Sometimes I tell, tell my academic friends, right, you know, you have it easy. You interpret the book, but the book doesn't offer any resistance. You can do whatever you want with the book. Uh, you know, maybe uh, there's even academics who, who say that misinterpretation, there's, pro you can be, there's productivity in misinterpretation uh, and, and, and getting it right, and getting, not getting it right in reading a book. I, I do believe that too. And I do believe that happens too, by the way, in the analytics space, because misinterpretations and misunderstandings can be productive. Or more than productive can produce, can, can give us access to something. Um, but there's a difference that is that the book will never answer. And the person answers and they can tell you, oh, they can tell you from, oh, you're absolutely wrong. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that is. Or they might, they, they will have an emotional reaction to it, right? In a way that a book doesn't have. So there's, you know, um, you know, so that when people make those analogies between interpretation in the, in let's say in the literary field and in the analytic field, I have, a, I have my reservations about that. You know, it's kind of like, well, like interpreting a person is like interpreting a book and, you know, people will make analogies like that. And I, I disagree. There's lots of differences between them. By the way, I think that the best way into, and, that, and that's my bias, and people will have different opinions about this. I do think that the best way into an analysis are the arts or the humanities. It's a way of thinking that's more akin to analytic sensibility, uh, even interpretation. Um, I think so, especially if you let's say if you're a psychiatrist or, or a psychologist who comes from programs here, especially in the US that are not analytically oriented, they're more based on, let's say, experimental psychology or other, you know, or, you know, other forms of things. It, it, I, I've heard from people that it takes kind of like the process of relearning, kind of like mm -hmm. you have to relearn a bunch of things and reformat your mind and get you used to something else. I didn't find that. I mean, and well, also because I didn't have anything to compare it with before, right? I didn't, I, I didn't have a clinical formation. So that's, I, I don't know to do anything but psychoanalysis. So that's, I guess, I don't know if, it's, if that's good or bad. Um, it's I good. Didn't have to, uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't have to unlearn it. Uh, but also the sensibility, the, the interpretive stance, the, the, um, you know, reading, I think, I always tell people when they train, I mean, sometimes just reading literature is much more productive to understanding people mm -hmm. and the unconscious than reading all these pep web papers or pseudo scientific papers that sometimes just tire me or reading philosophy or reading history. Um, and I think in the way that's what Freud had in mind in, in some way, I mean, like, uh, you have to have life experiences, but also just read and read uh, the way he read. He read everything. Mm -hmm. uh, anthropology. I mean, a whole bunch of things. That's where psychoanalysis comes from. That's interesting, right? That it comes from what Freud read, which was, he didn't read psychoanalysis to become <laughs> psychoanalyst. Uh, and we don't read that kind of things that we read. I think we should be doing more, more of that reading. Um, he had a problematic relation with philosophy, I think. He said that he always secretly, at one point, I think he said, secretly wanted to become a, uh, that he, when he ended his life, when, when he was writing, uh, you know, the more, the, his books on, on culture, uh, you know, civilization and discontent, I think he said something like, well, you know, at the end of my life, I finally ended up doing what I wanted to ultimately do, which was philosophy. Uh, but... <laughs> But as a, a, an interesting thinker, uh, every uh, interesting thinker has, all he has to say about philosophy is terrible through his work. Um, um, I think there was, this, you know, this uh, jealousy, envy, or, you know, the narcissism of small differences he had with Nietzsche that, you know, the, with, when it comes to the id. Um, uh, so uh, to, the, to the conceptualization of the id, which is in Nietzsche before Freud, and he knew that and, and probably read that. Uh, but, but he also says, and going back to the li reading literature, that uh, 
that psychoanalysis is uh, uh, um, actually is, we could interpret him as saying that psychoanalysis, he says that what he's doing in psychoanalysis had already been said by the poets. He, he always says that. Mm -hmm. What he did was kind of like, concept, you know, make it, it, turn it into a conceptual language and a, and a form of therapy. So that can be interpreted as psychoanalysis being, uh, you know, its heritage is poetry and literature more than anything else. Um, or, you know, the, 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 the science of the 19th and early, early 20th century, which was, a, which was a fascinating and interesting version of, of, of science and, and non-science everything but science. We can think about, for example, hypnotism, right? That is like this, lived in this kind of like this in between something scientific, but something that remain, remain, uh, belong to the, to the, to the realm of superstition, right? So to speak mm -hmm. in some way. So it, psychoanalysis also comes from that, that tension, I think. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit where I come from. Um, and, uh, and what I feel is that I also think, and tying it to the, to the, um, uh, to working with immigrants and with people of color, I think that, you know, I think uh, I mentioned Nietzsche before. He says that philosophy is nothing but uh, like a something like is like philosophy is nothing like uh, nothing but uh, like a secret expression of what's ultimately autobiography and 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 some form of 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 history right like like we might the like the history like whatever we do uh in our, i think in or we think has always a secret his very personal history i've always discovered you know when i'm writing something for example to publish something like something philosophical i discover mostly after the fact that it had very personal I had very personal reasons to write about this, mm -hmm. connected to my life and what I was living through there. I always discovered, and now they tend to be a little more in tune one with the other. So with, with working with analytically with uh, people of color, I think it's a way of also kind of, you know, working on, in some sense, on my own issues, my own problems, healing my own wounds, you know, with becoming an immigrant leaving my country and more than an immigrant an expatriate i can't you know there isn't a country to go back to um, all my everybody has left you know you, you've seen the situation in venezuela uh there's the latest the greatest immigration emigration in in the whole world uh, millions of people have left the country including my family my friends so i don't have a country to go back to so it feels like a little bit like i'm in exile uh, and I, you know, so it's it's a wound. I feel wounded by that, and I think it's a way of of healing my own wound and and maybe working. I mean, kind of like doing here what I wasn't able to do in my own country. Uh, you know, back there I was very involved in not only as uh, as I was an academic, but I wrote for the newspaper on on politics and was very more politically involved. So you know, there's compensations and forms of self-healing through through the the work we do um there's a there's a secret history and a more personal history but that's that i'm not going to tell you that's too private <laughs> and i was just going to say that i think this work is so important that you're doing because i had i worked at woodhull um, which we used to oh, refer right, back right, and right, forth right to there. the puerto rican family clinic so i'm very familiar and uh, and I did the same thing. I didn't bring a little couch into the office, but I put lamps instead of like that horrible yeah. light. And I, I just like work it. with people analytically just because that's my way of being. Uh, and I was actually working there while I was in analytic training as well. And like the thing that disturbed me so much about analytic training is like they're sitting there telling me like, this this huge long process they're teaching of like how to even let someone come in for analysis and like who's analyzable versus who's not meanwhile i'm working with people uh, at the hospital i worked in the paul Porosky clinic which is the hiv clinic and like it, i had the same experience where people were just so happy that someone is actually listening to them because they'd been in the system for so long and like 
just nobody listens. They're all just like, here, do this, do this. And it's like a full-time job, like you said, trying to get SSI, having to go to all these appointments, especially if you're sick. People couldn't get a job because if they got a job, then they would lose their health benefits and they needed their health benefits because they had HIV. So they couldn't work even if they wanted to, you know, it's like, and then I'm sitting there like listening analytically, which they really appreciated. But on the other hand, like you said, feeling impotent because I'm like, how is someone ever going to feel better when they don't have a stable place to live? You know what I mean? And they yeah, keep getting yeah. shuffled around through these systems. And what, what I've also, I, I, I emphasize with everything you've said, and uh, what I think should happen is that, and, and the other thing you probably saw is that we, when you work as a therapist in that system, you're also basically a caseworker, mm -hmm. right? And I think that ideally, and, and this is what, um, you know, people should get, uh, there should be more resources for this. Ideally, I think a therapist, and the experience I had should only be the therapist. And then the person should also have a caseworker separately from the caseworker. Kind of like very much in the, in the sense of like when there is like in transference uh, focused uh, psychotherapy for borderline patients, where you're the therapist and then these other things, right, that people might require seeing a, you know, psychiatrist or uh, people, you know, maybe somebody who might have an eating disorder and is cutting themselves. So that's, so kind of like let the, the keep the space uh, open so that the therapist doesn't have to worry about these other things, right? I think that's important. Of course, you have to keep them in mind, right? These things are intertwined with everything that the person is. But on the practical level, right? If you're the, also the person, right? You're, you're, you're the analyst, you're, you're gonna say the analyst, but also the person, let's say calling to help them find such and such a thing, things get modeled in a way that I don't think allows for, for, for many important things to be talked about. So I think these things should be kept separate, ideally. Um, so that's one thing uh, that I, am listening to you. Uh, and the other thing is that you, you get burned out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw so many, I had a bunch of patients, I don't know, like 40 patients, mm -hmm. and working psychoanalytically, psychodynamically with 40 people, all of whom have very complex traumas, mm -hmm. is exhausting. It burns you out right after a while uh so ideally then you should have less cases you should have more people people should get better paid so that not only interns or you know people just fresh out of college see these very complicated cases that again i respect them because right it's like you're being thrown you know into this wilderness right where there's all these dangers so I really respect that, but but then you're not going to have people that are the most experienced should be the one working with that population, but they're not going to work there because they're not they're not going to work there for for that day. Mm -hmm. So that's one the last thing, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up, uh, is that I I really invite uh, I I I always say that people, you know, who have generally been marginalized from psychoanalysis you know, black, brown, queer people, immigrants, uh, everybody to, you know, not necessarily could be an institute, doesn't have to be an institute to kind of like try and train. And, and, and uh, I think we need, I, we need this population. Psychoanalysis was born out of, it was considered a Jewish science. So it was born out of the margins, right? Out of what's normal. It wasn't only born out of the margins, but it worked on was marginal, right? Freud worked on dreams, parapraxis, everything that wasn't considered serious uh, in a serious object of study in psychology mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the psychi psychiatric es establishment at the time with everything that's dispensable. That's what he took as his object of study. So I think that we need more people, if psychoanalysis, is meant to be inherited, I think, by marginalized populations. I, I've become convinced of this. If it's gonna have a future, I think so. Uh, if it have, if, and if it's gonna have a future that remains true to its origins, I think. Um, 
Uh, so I think that's the last thing I say. It, I think that's important. And, if, and uh, it has to be more, I've, I've also said on the other hand, I think that like a mainstream psychoanalysis is a contradiction in terms kind of like the way psychoanalysis became here in the, in the 50s, especially 50s and 60s, ego psychology, you know, it was like the only kind of treatment, you know, there were waiting lists for uh, to, to see analysts and this or that. So for me, that was the death of psychoanalysis, in my opinion, totally the death of psychoanalysis. So when it became mainstream, it died. So now we need people from the margins to take over, to make it relevant again and make it important, not in a mainstream way, not in a normalized or normalizing way, but in a way that is truly, you know, again, uh, uh, truly faithful, I think, to the origins, which is working with what people don't want to work with, what, what people don't want to think about, um, which is more than relevant today, more than ever, I, I believe so. It's not, I'm not trying to sell psychoanalysis. I don't try, try selling anything, but when I compare it to other forms of manualized uh, self-help consumerism, I say, well, I think this, uh, this is worth uh, saving or worth still working with um, and maybe changing it and maybe changing it to, in a way that becomes unrecognizable in, in, a, in some years, right? So I, it's an invitation to people who, to you know, come and train and be part of it, or, or, or just study it somehow. I, you know, think that's important. I think that's the last thing I'll say. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Carlos Padron. For more. Please watch the documentary Psychoanalysis and El Barrio, which is for free on PepWeb this month, and order the book Psychoanalysis in El Barrio. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry from Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash V-A-N-E-S-S-A two three C-A-R-L. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.com. Dot org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. She is a vessel for such spirits strong dead of both of lineage and of adoption. Fuck in the pool.
have landscapes, you're about to practice sexual nature. Sexuality preceding the eye. One grappling with sexuality with ones. But when I fill the psychoanalytic snakes and lemon balm, contained a small, out to perform a ritual or attend the next program, we're cutting ourselves out of our To honor my lineage with another of identity, just more so to honor my lineage. The apocryphal back and change hour, whose object, a biological, first rays of movement, physical before we reproduction 